Hi, Dohan. Hi. Uh, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Dohan Aluka, and I'm the JavaScript specialty lead for an IT consulting firm in Washington, D.C., Excella Consulting. Um, I've consulted for uh, nonprofits, uh, the federal government projects, and also worked on enterprise applications. And my passion is uh, consumer uh, facing applications and mobile apps. Uh, so I'm kind of interested in both worlds of software development. One is uh, this awesome web development, and the other is this, you know, you know boring enterprise development. But in between the, those two things, uh, I actually learn a lot of things where I can borrow ideas from, uh, you know, how they do it at, you know, on the web, and then kind of try to pull that into enterprise as much as possible, uh, so that the lives of the lives of the developers are actually b better as a result mm -hmm. uh, of bringing those web practices into into the enterprise. Mm -hmm. Got it. And uh, you're giving a talk um, at NGConf. Yeah, it's on doing more with less JavaScript. Okay. And uh, this is something that's this is something that I've kind of realized when I went to NodeConf a couple of years ago, and you know observed all the you know Node core developers and how they try to pare down everything to their bare minimum, bare essentials. And I realized the more you try to pull into a project, like for, for example, there was a period where everyone would install NPM and then you know, do NPM install Bower. And I had a realization, you know, you're basically pulling in two package managers and you don't really understand why you're doing it, uh, which resulted in a lot of projects having multiple versions of Angular and uh, people didn't even know which version of Angular they were actually running you know, on, on runtime. So really understanding what you're working with and paring down to the bare minimum essentials is, is kind of the message that I'm trying to send to everyone. And what kind of uh, challenges were you seeing as a result of people kind of having too many things that they don't really know what they are? What, what happens is uh, I actually have this Pretty awesome slide. Uh, it's, it starts with a you know a hand with you know with, with almost holding the sun you know in their hands you know it's their vision, and then you start you know installing libraries and you know I had like a row of sandbags uh, with you know technology names on them, and then you go read some blog and then you you know download more packages. And then, you know, before you know it, your vision is completely blocked by you know, these dozens of tools and libraries, and you're dealing with, you know, the, bu the bugs and the quirks uh, of of all these packages. And what happens? A lot of people who just want to get something done over a weekend end up giving up. Mm. You know, they had a, they had a simple idea that they just wanted to push out there, and they just become frustrated and they say, you know. You know, this, this whole thing is bad. You know, Angular is bad because of, you know, some Angular library they brought in, you know, just to do something simple, whereas they could have just written, you know, a very simple directive, you know, if they focus on learning, you know, actual bindings and, and all those things, they can just do those things easily uh, by themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a little bit of, you know, trusting in yourself. Uh, that you can do these things mm -hmm. and they're not that difficult. But we kind of cheat and try to, you know, go the easy way, you know, pulling in someone else's work. And that's when we kind of uh, realize a little bit too late that uh, we've, you know, brought this entire baggage uh, along with us now. We have to deal with it. So when do you think is the right time? Like when, when do you think is the right time to be consuming, uh, you know, using an, uh, installing an add-on or installing a plugin or, um, you know, choosing to use a tool? So I would say, you know, after exhausting every possible, you know, other venue. And where do you start? You start with the tools that you already work with. Uh, for example, you know, I've, when I first learned about underscore or Lodash, you know, I. I just use it for underscore dot each, you know, for for loops. And then, you know, I started 
wanted to do other things. Like for example, I was, you know, pulling pulling some uh, web server for some data, and didn't want to overwhelm my server. So I I, need, I wanted to implement some kind of a throttling mechanism. So first thing that came into my mind, okay, you know, I'm gonna write this 300 line, you know, awesome logic. Uh, it's gonna work great. It's gonna do this th throttling thing, and then. Okay, maybe I shouldn't write it myself. Let me go check on npm, and I see all these, you know, throttling libraries out there. And then I, I npm install a few things. You know, I try them out. Well, okay. And then almost by chance, I look at, you know, the unders underscore uh, documentation, and they have a throttle function built into underscore. I, I didn't know about this. Uh, so, so now I've changed the way I think about it. I first look at the documentation of the tools that I or, that I'm already using to see if they're if they're doing what I want them to do. After I exhaust that yeah. option, then I move to npm to see if someone else did it, and only then you know I, I kind of invented myself. Yeah. And do you find um, do you find yourself learning from from some implementations? Like if if you if you encounter something that doesn't kind of fit into uh, fit what you want, like what what's your kind of process for for uh, f you know writing that thing yourself when necessary? Yeah, so that really comes down to I like writing I like writing code that's pleasant to use by others. Uh, so uh, and this really you know gets into you know, writing great APIs philosophy or, or like writing great libraries uh, philosophy. So when I pick a library, I really look, you know, is it, is it pleasant to use? Is it easy to read, you know, when I work with it? And sometimes if I like a tool, but it's not quite getting there, that's when I kind of crack open the, you know, the source code for it and I try to understand what are they doing? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and only then uh, kind of, you know, if I feel like, I can add to it, make it better. Uh, then I send a pull request uh, to try and improve that library. But there are also certain instances uh, where there's this awesome uh, project called Camo uh, that allows you to interact with MongoDB in a, using ES6 promises. Mm. Uh, I mean, now that those features are built into uh, the native MongoDB driver, uh, but you know, a couple years ago that wasn't the case, and this library had a beautiful way of interacting with objects, it made your code very clean, uh, but I started having lots of issues with it. So we kind of dug into the source code and kind of saw that it was, it was unredeemable without a, you know, a full rewrite. You know, at that point, you kind of make a choice and I, I, I've decided to kind of create my own library called document.ts. Uh, that kind of, uh, you know, avoids the mistakes that I learned uh, from the Camo project, mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of gets out of the way. So rather than me being a Camo expert or a mongoose expert, uh, all these third-party libraries, uh, it aims to surface as, as much native functionality as mm -hmm. possible, so that I can actually become a MongoDB expert. You know, and, and that's really the key here uh, with libraries. You know, if they're hiding the, the underlying technology too much from you, you're, you're becoming a, an expert of this third-party library. Whereas you should actually be becoming an expert of the underlying technology, and these libraries should be accelerators. So kind of like the CLI, you know. Your first experience with Angular shouldn't be the CLI tool. It should be the, the five-minute tutorial where you uh, it's the, the five-minute tutorial, which will take you two hours to do, uh, <laughs> where you manually wire up everything, you know, and painfully so, so you understand how things, you know, fit together and appreciate. <laughs> exactly, uh, and once you've kind of understood how things are wired up, then yeah, switch over to NGCLI because that's your productivity enhancer for you. And uh, what do you think um, is the role of, of like, what, what does a good framework do for a developer? I think you mentioned it, that, uh, that it should be an accelerator, but uh, what, what other things do you think a framework should do and kind of try to avoid? There is a difference between a framework and a platform. Uh, so AngularJS uh, was a framework, and Angular Platform 
uh, is is a collection of tools and libraries that enable you to do uh, better things. So when it's a framework and it's mo monolithic, and you get you can get stuck with it, uh, and you when you're stuck with something, uh, that makes your life miserable. I mean, if you're working for an enterprise, this is your day job, and you're stuck with Angular version, you know, 1.2 uh, for four years, you're not going to enjoy your life. However, if you're using a platform like Angular, you're bringing in only the stuff that you need into it. Uh, I would say a good framework is, is one that allows you an exit strategy mm -hmm. and allows you uh, to, to compose uh, your own solution using the parts that work for you. Mm -hmm. That's one of the ideas behind kind of Backbone JS. Uh, initially, it was initially a framework, and then they've kind of made it into an unframework. Uh, and then there's this awesome book by uh, Henrik Yuratek uh, called The Human JavaScript. I highly recommend everyone reads this. Uh, he talks about how you know, the router is a completely separate thing, how you know, the template render is a completely separate thing. And I've actually architected a 250 view, 100,000 lines of code JavaScript front end uh, for this retirement system that's expected to survive for the next 30 years. Uh, so there, I was designing for change. I didn't introduce a framework where you have to use that framework for the next 30 years. I introduced parts of a framework that works for today, but down the line, uh, you can kind of add your own stuff or new stuff to it, and it will grow with you. What do you think is the process for a person to go from, from a beginner you know, to someone who can do that, because I think it's, it, it, it requires a certain level of acquired expertise to be able to make the right decisions, right? And what, what do you, how would you suggest someone kind of think about their career such that they could actually uh, be at some point in position to make those kind of decisions that will actually last and will be upgradable over time? So I actually work with a lot of uh, recent college grads or you know graduates of uh, code camps, I encourage them to to make mistakes as often as possible because without making mistakes, you don't really learn. Uh, so once somebody comes to me with an idea, you know, hey, I want to do it this way, and in my mind, I immediately identify, you know, okay, you know, uh, he or she, you know, is going to fa fail and you know, this and this exact way, but I actually encourage them, yes, you should absolutely go ahead and, you know, implement your, your idea, your solution, and then let's see what happens. So, you know, give them a week or two, and then, you know, and then they come to me. It's like, hey, this thing is not quite working, and then that's an opportunity for me to uh, kind of, uh, you know, g get into why, you know, things aren't working for them and why they should do you know certain things so pick a pick a mentor you know and definitely work with them but also if you're kind of by yourself just push things out there you know relentlessly don't, don't be embarrassed that your code isn't good enough to be on github you know we're, we're kind of all in the same boat you know I push some pretty terrible code on github but the thing is the only way I get better is that I push that terrible code out there, uh, and you know, sometimes it's really bad, and then you know, people comment on it, and that's that's my learning opportunity so that I can improve it. You know, also ship things, push, you know, publish things. If you make us a little website, push it out there. Let it crash. Let it have tons of errors. That's how you're gonna learn, you know, how to avoid those mistakes uh, in the future. So, another kind of advice is. Don't do this with your, you know, day job. You know, keep your experimentation time separate from your kind of, you know, day job time. Your day job code should be boring and, you know, verbose, uh, and it should just work. But your experimentation code, you know, go wild, go crazy. 
you know, uh, you know, go out in flames, so to speak. Uh, and, and so that's going to allow you to make a lot of mistakes, and and by making a lot of mistakes, you're going to learn a lot faster. That's a really great advice. Um, if someone wanted to reach you on the internet, what would be the best way to do that? Uh, I'd be on Twitter at Deluca. Uh, otherwise, I have you know stuff on GitHub. You can create issues, pull requests. Uh, I have some uh, Docker images where you can kind of uh, uh, pull those images and you know publish your own project uh, with it. Cool. Other, I mean, otherwise, email works as well, but. Uh, but I, I kind of prefer these discussions to happen kind of in the public so that uh, month la months later or weeks later, someone uh, you know, searching for something can actually stumble on that conversation and kind of uh, read it and, and gain something from it. That's great. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sarah. Hey there. Are you into reactive programming using JavaScript? Do you have to deal with asynchrony in your web app? And join this dot instructor Ben Lesh to learn all of the ins and outs of RxJS in his hands-on workshop. Available online and in person, go to rxworkshop.com for more details and to book your spot today.